Welcome to Political Buzz. I'm Phil Arno. Well, we're done with election night. And although it may be another week or two before anything is official, I think we pretty much know the results. On this Political Buzz, we'll talk a little bit about what happened and maybe get a little insight into why. And I'd like to welcome my guest now, Vic Martucci of uh, Masiello Martucci and Associates. And uh, boy, plenty to talk about today, uh, Vic. Uh, the, uh, the results of the election, <clears throat> let's start with uh, the Buffalo's mayor election, mayoral election. Uh, Byron Brown has come through, it seems, uh, handily. Uh, it, we, we're talking about write-in votes, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we can't say specifically there were votes for Byron, but that's the assumption because they're write-in votes. That, that's correct. Um, so what happened last night is the, if you can picture the ballot in the box where you would write in a candidate's name, there's also an oval that you would color in. And that's the same oval that you would color in opposite a candidate's name if you were voting for a particular candidate on the ballot. So by coloring in that oval, the computer reads that as a write-in vote. So it counted it as a write-in vote. It does not know who the uh, voter wrote in. It just knows that there's a write-in vote. But the reality is, is that um, you know, 95, 99% of those write-in votes are going to be uh, Mayor Brown's. So the write-in candidates has um, a little over 10,000 vote lead. Um, and there's about roughly uh, 5,000 absentee ballots yet to be counted. Um, the other thing to note is, is, and the machine doesn't pick this up, is um, if you wrote the mayor's name in but didn't color in the oval, um, the, the vote still counts, but the machine doesn't know that there was a write-in vote there. So the likelihood is, is that that 10,000 vote lead for write-in will expand. Um, after all the, the ballots are, are hand counted. Now, is this uh, considered to be a surprise to anyone, or when, when push comes to shove, was this basically what was expected by people who were kind of in the know? I mean, uh, you know, India Walton got 12,000 votes in the primary. That made her the official Democrat uh, candidate, but um, she was kind of an outsider when it comes to the, um, you know, the the main the, the philosophy of the city. You know, the social Democrat is is not exactly what a, what Buffalo is all about, and there was some kind of a debate as to which whether or not that's where we were going, but for all intent and purposes. Uh, that was not really where Buffalo was for the most part. At least that's, that was the expected uh, result in terms of socialism. Uh, th there's all kinds of spin you could put on social democrat or whatever. Was that a surprise, the, 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 the outcome? No, um, and the reason it, it, it was not a surprise um, is because you know people in, in, in our business rely on polling. And uh, Emerson College had done two recent polls, one uh, about a week before the election. The first one was about a month before the election. About a month before the election, uh, Byron Brown had a 10-point lead. Um, that lead expanded to 18 points one week prior to the election. Byron Brown's positive rating was over 60%. India Walton's was just barely under 30%. Um, the number one issue in the campaign was overwhelmingly crime. So, um, in my opinion, uh, when I saw that Emerson poll last week, one week out from the election, it made it very clear that two things had to happen for the mayor. One, he had to get his vote out, and two, his voters had to execute the write-in properly. Um, we know he got his vote out based on the, uh, the numbers and the returns from last night, as well as the early voting. Uh, by the way, the mayor won the early voting, or the write-in won the early voting two to one. Um, and the write-in candidate won every councilmanic district in the early voting. So that part of the, of the execution, the tactics worked. Now we're going to find out two weeks um, uh, from now 
whether or not the execution of the write-in worked. Um, for India Walton to win, she's going to have to hope that over 10,000 or nearly one-third of the write-in ballots will get thrown out because they weren't properly executed. That's a pretty high bar. Yeah. <clears throat> Overall, the, the uh, attendance, uh, the turnout for the city of Buffalo, was that considered to be a, a, a very heavy turnout, or was that uh, medium? How, what, how do you gauge the turnout it, in this particular it, race? In historic terms, it was a high turnout. It was about 37%. Um, but, you know, when you consider what was at stake and the high profile of the race, um, at least for me personally, I'm still surprised that, you know, turnout is under 50% um, in a race like that. But it was. Um, but to the mayor's credit and his team, um, they dramatically increased the turnout among his, um, among his voters. And, um, and that's why um, I believe when all the, the, the ballots are counting, counted in two weeks um, that uh, Mayor Brown will be declared the winner. Yeah, that's, it's, um, it's interesting. I expected a higher turnout myself because of the nature of the race. And with a higher turnout, I thought that that would heavily influence the, the county races, specifically the race for sheriff. Um, because that race, and that is a very, very strange race, because we had arguably three candidates on the conservative side to one candidate on the Democrat side. And with that kind of an of a imbalance on the ticket, and theoretically a heavy turnout in the city, you would think that the, that the, the Democrat running for sheriff of Erie County had an overwhelming uh, advantage in, in the race for sheriff. What happened there? there, there there's no question. Um, and it, it, again, in my opinion, without having any uh, data analyzed, um, that, that type of data is not available. Um, I think a couple things. One is, um, I think the Garcia campaign very effectively um, created the perception that Kim Beatty, by virtue of the fact that she was on the Working Families Party line, um, was not going to be strong on crime. Um, and, and there were some ads that, uh, that Garcia ran that, um, that showed the chaos in the streets of, of cities around the country um, where there are Democrat socialist mayors. Now, that's not who Kim Beatty is, and, and, and that wasn't what she ran on. Um, but I think Garcia's campaign very effectively created that perception in voters' minds. And again, if you, as I mentioned earlier in the mayor's race with the Emerson College poll, crime was overwhelmingly the number one issue in the city of Buffalo. So although that city turnout should have benefited the Democrat candidate for sheriff, it didn't because the perception of those voters in the city of Buffalo, I believe, was that John Garcia would be tougher on crime than Kim Beatty. And I, I think that's what happened there. If you know, how, how was the uh, turnout throughout the county? Was that uh, average or heavy turnout? Um, the, the turnout countywide uh, was about 34%. Um, so uh, it was a little bit lower than, than, than the city of Buffalo overall. Um, in a year when the county executive doesn't run, uh, that's a fairly decent turnout. Um, and in large part, it was driven by the mayoral race. The, 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 uh, the city turnout was higher than normal. Um, the suburban turnout was lower than normal. Uh, the, the Republican Party, interestingly, did not support Garcia uh, as their candidate as strongly as you might expect. I mean, he was not originally their candidate, uh, and he won in the primary, uh, that, you know, and he replaced their candidate. Uh, so it, it was a kind of a strange situation. He basically was supported more by the conservative party than the Republican party. And, and that's very strange because out of the gate, the other candidates combined, they had 20,000 votes. 
So he spotted the, the Democrat 20,000 votes to begin with, and still came out ahead. I mean, it, it, right now, they're not a calling it official, but he's a couple points ahead, and it looks like he's got a lead that, that will hold up, okay, at this point in time. Um, is the Republican Party got something going on where they're a little chaotic right now? I mean, what, what can explain the situation where they're not really doing that well? They're not supporting their main candidate for sheriff. Uh, they lost the comptroller's race. It, there's, it doesn't seem like a strong showing. Yeah, I, I think I'm not so sure that it was that the that the Republican Party didn't support the Republican nominee John Garcia after he won the primary, as they you know political parties today don't have the influence um, that they once had, and so you had two Republicans on minor party lines, um, one that openly endorsed the Democrat candidate. A Karen Healy case, who was the endorsed Republican candidate um, before the primary, um, she endorsed the Democrat candidate, um, and uh, and Donato um, ran an active campaign um, on an on an independent line that 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 he created. So that that those two candidates represent over twenty thousand votes, most of which would have gone to John Garcia. So um, I, I don't know that it was a question of the Republican Party not supporting John Garcia as much as it was two Republican candidates that lost the Republican primary but decided um, uh, in one case to endorse the Democrat candidate and in the other case still run um, an active campaign. Um, you know, with respect to the, the county controller's race, um, Kevin Hardwick, the Democrat candidate, was definitely... Um, benefited by the um, the high, higher than normal city turnout. Um, that's what you would have expected in the sheriff's race. Uh, but as we talked about earlier, I think Garcia's campaign very effectively controlled the messaging in that race. Well, <clears throat> just a, an unscientific observation, most of the advertisements that I heard for Garcia um, seem to be coming from the cons conservative party and, and, and not the Republican Party. I, that's just my, my impression. Uh, and so I, I didn't see a lot of effort on the part of the Republican Party to uh, support Garcia. Now that, again... Well, that, mo most of the advertising that John Garcia ran, he raised that money on his own, um, which is typical for, for countywide candidates. Where parties get involved in elections is at the grassroots level. Um, particularly on election day and, and leading up to election day during early voting, making sure that their party's vote comes out. Um, and, um, you know, frankly, uh, they didn't do a good job countywide. As I mentioned, there was very low turnout countywide, and, um, uh, and, and Democrats won in, in, in most of the suburban, suburban towns um, and, and did a better job of getting their vote out. Okay, well, we're going to take a break now, but when we come back, I want to get into the, the, the national uh, political scene and how that's uh, playing out, uh, and, and, that's, and going forward, what we can expect uh, with everything that's going on. It's, it's, it's a very interesting picture. Uh, we'll be back right after this. Stay tuned. <music> Welcome back to Political Buzz. Uh, my guest is Vic Martucci, and uh, we've talked about the local election, um, and now I think we should get into uh, something that's playing out on the national level. Uh, let's go to the, the Virginia governor's race. That was very hotly contested, and, and, and it was kind of, you know, uh, uh, an indication of what's going on nationally. A lot of uh, people were paying attention to uh, Terry McAuliffe, who, who was um, the past governor of Virginia and was a very strong candidate, and I think he was favored in Virginia, uh, to a newcomer. Uh, Vic, tell me a little bit about that race and, and what played out there. 
Yeah, so um, Virginia, as we know, is a state that uh, President Biden carried by 14 points last year. Um, Glenn Youngkin, the Republican candidate for governor, never has run for public office before, private businessman. Um, and if you watched his, uh, his victory speech last night, he talked about how when they did their first poll, their internal poll, um, that only 2% of the electorate in Virginia knew who he was, with a margin of error of 3%, plus or minus, which meant that it could have been negative 1% that, had, that even knew who, who Glenn Youngkin was. So that's where he started out from. Um, and it's interesting because uh, what, what Glenn Youngkin very successfully did, and I think this is going to be a model, or it should be a model, uh, for Republican candidates going forward, is that he was able to run a very clean, issues-oriented campaign without being um, an acolyte of Donald Trump. Um, he did not invite Donald Trump to come into Virginia to campaign for him. Um, it's clear that Trump voters in Virginia voted for him, um, but he won because he was able to pick up uh, a majority of the independent vote, which Donald Trump lost last year, and he picked up 57 percent of the white female suburban vote, which Donald Trump lost last year. That's how Glenn Youngkin won this race. And so a um, couple things. If, if I'm the Democrat Party, um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to uh, tack to the center. Um, I, I'm going to want to move away from uh, that radical left agenda because clearly, um, at least in, a, in, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, where um, the last time a Republican was elected governor uh, was, I believe, in 2007, um, that, uh, th that the, the hard left politics is not resonating, and in fact, people are pushing back. And if I'm the Republican Party, um, I'm going to want to run issues-oriented campaigns with outstanding candidates. And let's be clear, uh, Glenn Youngkin is, a, is an outstanding candidate. And his lieutenant governor candidate, um, Winsome Sears, is the first black female ever Republican ever elected to statewide office in the Commonwealth of Virginia, former Marine, incredibly charismatic. Um, so... In my opinion, um, the table is set for the midterms next year. If the Democrats insist on following a hard left uh, issues strategy, um, they may be in for a rude awakening during the midterm elections. Well, you know, you said if you were in charge of the Democrat Party, you know, you would tack towards the center a little bit because the, what they're doing doesn't seem to be working. Um, they, they control both houses, they control the presidency. Um, is there any sign that the leadership of the Democrat Party is getting that message? Because they're pushing, uh, because of, you know, a lot of their, their backers, uh, you know, the, 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 the teachers and, and, and AOC and, and that segment of the party, they're pushing the critical race theory, they're pushing um, a lot of, a lot of uh, things that are, are to the hard left. And, you know, the socialist agenda, uh, whether you call it, whatever you, whether you call it Democrat socialist or social Democrat or however, you, whatever spin you put on it, that's the, the direction that they've been going at a national level. And they, They've got control of everything. And Nancy Pelosi, I think, is trying to rein it in, but she's having no success. Okay, so yeah. beyond her, I, I don't know what leadership there is. Maybe it's Obama. Maybe it's, it's the, the people who Obama have been, has been putting in place. Is there any indication that that's where they're going to go? Well, it's interesting because the Democrats um, understood that last year when um, Bernie Sanders uh, was the early front runner for their party's nomination for president of the United States. And, and they knew that was going to be a disaster. And so um, they, they set up their party rules in a way where they were able to affect the outcome and deliver the endorsement or the nomination to uh, uh, President Biden 
who was viewed as a moderate. Um, and throughout his Senate career, President Biden was a moderate. The mistake President Biden has made so far um, in his first year in office is he's tacked hard to the left. And I think that's been a serious mistake. And I think that does two things. One is the public is wondering um, what happened to the Joe Biden that they voted for because they wanted to end the Trump nightmare. Um, and they thought they were getting a moderate president that was going to heal and bring people together. Um, and, and the president ha hasn't governed that way. Um, so uh, I think, you know, they, they've articulated it. They understand it. But they haven't figured, to your point, they haven't figured out how to rein it in yet, um, is evidenced by the fact that they haven't been able to pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Um, because the, the, the hard left tail is wagging the Democrat dog, particularly in the House of Representatives. Well, what happens uh, with this late, latest result? Um, are they going to, uh, do you think they're going to hear the message? Or are they going to dig in and, and try and get as much done while they have the chance? I mean, they're, they're trying to spend trillions of dollars. They're trying to pass uh, climate change rules that, that will basically strap the country's uh, energy policies and uh, put huge burdens on, on companies, uh, the way they do business. I mean, they're, they're going to, I don't know, will they try to get as much done or will they hear the message? That's, that's the question. Yeah, I, 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 I suspect that that's the path they're going to follow um, because, uh, you know, historically the party out of power uh, from the White House in the first midterm election loses between 20 and 25 seats in the House of Representatives. The Republicans picked up two of three open seats in congressional elections this year. So the Republicans only need to pick up three. And I think, I think the Democrats will, will never admit this publicly. They probably understand and believe that they're going to lose the majority in the midterm elections, and they're going to try to get as much done as they possibly can. The problem they have is that it's a 50-50 split in the United States Senate, and two of those 50 are moderate Democrats, Joe Manchin from West Virginia and Kirsten Sinema from Arizona. Um, and they very successfully um, have been able to block the hard left agenda in the United States Senate. So um, it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, but the Republicans aren't out of the woods yet either. They're perfectly capable of snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. If they go down that path of blind allegiance to Donald Trump, um, that would play right into the Democrats' hands. And, and, and so if you're a Republican, you're hopeful they don't do that. So, so what you're saying is you don't think that Trump is a, is a winner going forward? The Trump personality is not. Many of the Trump policies are. That's what I believe happened in Virginia yesterday. Um, Trump is a lightning rod. Um, and in my opinion, and I've said this before, um, and I'm a Republican, um, you know, the, the, the way Trump governed, uh, the, the, the use of, 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 of the bully pulpit um, to divide, that's who Donald Trump is as a personality. And that's not good for the country, and it's not good for the Republican Party. And I well, think the Republicans would be uh, wise to heed that. You, you, might, uh, you might have a campaign slogan going forward, do you want a nasty winner or a sleepy loser? I'm, I'm not sure if that's the way they're going to run it in the, in the future. But we've got about two minutes left. And I just wanted to mention, you had a, a personal uh, interest in this last election locally. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I did, and thanks for asking. So my, my little sister, Gina Santa Maria, ran for the first time uh, for public office this year for town council member in the town of Tonawanda, and uh, she won, and she was the high vote getter. Um, so Gina, if you're watching, uh, Big Brother's proud of you, and uh, you're going to do a great job uh, as a town council member and, 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 and working hard for your constituents in the town of Tonawanda. So congratulations. Yeah, and I wonder if she got any good advice while she was running. I wonder who she might have. Yeah, I don't to. know, or, or 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 maybe or maybe she ignored it, and 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 uh, that's why she won. Who knows? <laughs> well, I, we'll see. I, you know, I'm, I'm betting she had some connections, 
Okay, well, <laughs> this is an interesting discussion. Going forward, we're going to uh, have to discuss that Donald Trump thing again. I'm sure that's going to come up. Um, I want to thank. He's not going thing. away. He's no, not going no, away. You're absolutely right. Not anytime right. soon. No, absolutely not. D definitely a lightning rod, like you say. Okay, uh, that's it for this political buzz. I want to thank Vic Martucci for being my guest. A lot of insight there. And uh, we want to thank you for watching Political Buzz and for watching WBBZ TV. We always appreciate that as your only local TV station in Western New York. So thanks again, and we will see you next time on Political Buzz.